I was studying the usefulness of radio labeled imaging agents to study the coronary artery disease and hopefully to uh, detect blockages in the coronary arteries using radioactive tracers and special cameras. The animals that I used were dogs. I did not have in my mind at the time where those dogs were obtained. I assumed they were purchased from dealers, but they could have been pound seizure animals for all I knew at the time. The dogs were anesthetized and the tracers were injected intravenously and we did imaging to detect where the radio tracers were going in the heart. Then, in order to understand the distribution of the radio tracer into the coronary arteries and into the heart muscle, uh, we took the dogs off the gantries, we took them in the uh, operating suite, and we opened their chests, removed their hearts, and then sliced the heart into sections so that we could study them grossly and under the microscope. The life of a beagle at HRC comprised being shut in a barren, unfriendly cell with no bedding or play objects. They were allowed just half a spadeful of sawdust to aid the cleaning out process and a food and water bowl. It was a terrible way for a highly sociable pack animal to have to spend his or her life. On top of these conditions, the beagles then had to endure the pain and suffering associated with the daily toxicity tests. I watched as these tiny bundles of pent-up energy threw themselves around their small, bare cells, bored and frustrated. On opening the cage door, they would tumble out and hurl themselves up and down the room. As one beagle was released, others would catch sight of him or her darting around and start barking excitedly, waiting for their turn. After just a couple of minutes of frantic activity, they would struggle in my arms as I picked them up to return them to their cages. Once back in, they would throw themselves at the cage door as I closed it behind them. After having worked in the unit for just a short while, I soon discovered that this excitable behaviour shown by the puppies, the darting around and refusing to return to their cages, does not last long in most of the dogs. In just a few weeks, those who still ventured out of their cages, and many would not, would meekly return, offering no resistance, their spirit broken. If you subscribe to the notion that that kind of research is essential to advance human medicine and your career and your life revolve around advancing human medicine, then you come to see it as a necessary evil. It wasn't until I was doing it that I realized that wasn't true, but that's how you view it. Um, I had dogs who lived with me at the time. I love dogs. The way I always put it was, if anyone tried to harm my dogs, I'm afraid I might kill them. It sounds extreme, but that's how your mind works when your dogs are your children. And yet here I was, uh, getting in my car every day, going to um, the cardiology department, to my lab, and killing dogs. When you compartmentalize it, you can keep cognitive dissonance at arm's length. You can defend your psyche by understanding that your dogs are your family and this is your work and your work is focused on saving lives. There came a time when I started to realize that what I was doing with dogs in the laboratory wasn't quite what I thought it was in terms of contributing to human health. And that began to dovetail with the dissonance aspect of it. I was losing the battle with cognitive dissonance. And I finally had to realize that the only difference between my dogs and these dogs was that my dogs got lucky. That's not a basis for using an animal for experiments and killing the animals. One got lucky, 